I am here to feed her. What can I do? Sometimes my daughter, she is cruel. Sometimes she bites into my flesh, but not enough to cut far into the skin. And she watches me in her grip. Sometimes I start to pull away. Sometimes I cry out and my eyes fill with tears. Sometimes without thinking, I will say, why do you hurt me? You are so cruel. But it's not fair for me to say those things. It is her right. She must take those things. She must take from me what she needs. Hey, welcome to Brown Girl Book Lover. I am Leslie and Murray. Today I am interviewing Caribbean Ferragosa of her lovely short story, short story collection, Eat the Mouth That Feeds You. Um, she's a fiction writer, journalist, and editor. She was raised in South El Monte, California by Mexican immigrants. She graduated from UCLA and then completed the, um, her MFA in creative writing at Carl Arts. Today, Ferragosa co-edits UC Press, a claim California cultural journal, Boom California, and is also the founder of South El Monte Art Posse, an interdisciplinary arts collective. Her fiction and nonfiction has appeared in numerous publications. Um, Eat the Mouth That Feeds You is her first short story collection. Caribbean, welcome to Brown Girl Book Lover. I'm so happy you're here. Thank you. I'm so glad that we made this happen. Thank you yeah. for the invitation, Leslie Ann. It's a great honor. Oh, yay. Um, first of all, why don't you tell us about your short story collection? Sure. So this is a short story collection uh, that I worked on over many years, like 20 years. Um, and I'm a little shy about saying that it took me this long, but the reason that it took so long is because I didn't know I was working on a short story collection. Uh, I started writing these stories as an undergrad at UCLA and uh, wrote them over the decades through much of my 20s, into motherhood through my 30s, and then here we are. I just turned 40 and my short story collection came out. And so it's been a long process. Um, I thought I was trying to write a novel, which I am, but I didn't realize that I had a whole body of stories that belonged together and that needed to be a book. And so eventually, thanks to the friend of uh, the, the advice and the encouragement of friends, I realized that I needed to publish it. And luckily, City Lights here in San Francisco, uh, just upstate from where I am, loved it and has been a great supporter of the book and so here we are uh with eat the mouth that feeds you um i love every story in this collection even when i didn't understand them because on the sense on this level your writing is lyrical it's sung to me it um tell me how do you craft such beautiful sentences right um that's a good question i I think the first step for me always is to try to hear the character and how they speak. And I feel like most people, everybody that I know has a particular way of speaking and there's a particular kind of music and the way they speak. And then I'm doing this with my body and also in the body. And so I, I try to channel that into the sentences I don't know. I, I try to find new ways of putting words together also. And I do it maybe not consciously, um, but it, but that is sort of important to me. And, and I try to, I don't know, I guess in finding the, the uniqueness of each voice, try to come up with interesting ways of, of saying things and visualizing things. So I think the result for me has been these sort of strange, somewhat musical sentences yeah it's 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 strange but beautiful and you're like wait a minute I've never like even thought of that in my life but I love it I will be forever haunted by the story me miro um uh, yes me muero uh-huh me, me muero because it makes me think that perhaps the dead um are frightened by their own death 
And so many of us feel dread to the world because we aren't seen, heard, and validated. Can you tell me about this story and how you came to write it? Right. So this story uh, really came to me in a dream. I sometimes have very vivid, very vivid dreams. Um, and so this entire story came to me one night and I wrote it down immediately. And it has gone through several revisions, but essentially most of the dream is there. And I woke up from that dream feeling very comforted actually, because we are so afraid of death and the uncertainty of that and the fear of pain and suffering. And I wanted, I don't know, I guess I wanted to address that in the story to, to sort of confront this ultimate terror that many of us have. So in this dream, I felt very comforted, like death isn't the end, first of all. And a lot of the suffering that we experience is experience around death and at the moment of death is really this kind of resistance to a process that is inevitable and it doesn't have to be so difficult and um and part of the process in the story is understanding or coming to terms with the relationships difficult relationships of the family and so the whole story revolves around these uh, really hard family dynamics. I think in, in so many of the other stories, there is these people feeling so withdrawn and feeling almost like that, right? Like just because of their isolation or everything else that is going on or, the, or their trauma. And this one was like the actual death. And I love just how you position that. And I just love how this dead body is walking through. And I was like, wait, is this real? Is this not real? <laughs> wait, she's not really dead. No, she's dead. Like, and I kept going back and forth. But I love that though, because so many times we think, especially when you're coming from an MFA program, that stories need to be very tactile. It needs to be concrete. This happens, B happens equals A. Mm -hmm. But I love that there's this abstractness and this like constant searching in this story. And that makes me as a reader and as a writer want to come back into this story and always figure it out. I love a story that feels like a puzzle. Yeah, totally. And I, I really hear what you're saying about the expectations of the MFA program. And I've heard this from, from friends of mine that have gone through other MFA programs, but I was uh, fortunate that I went to CalArts, uh, which is uh, an art school in California and they are uh, very supportive of experimentation and risk taking and that was the right thing for me because I've always kind of moved sort of flowed between different genres and styles and I've never really wanted to commit to like the rules of writing and what they're supposed to be and plus I feel very connected to the traditions of I don't know, like the typical reference, uh, like Gabriel Garcia Marquez and the surrealist traditions of Latin America. And um, those are special to me. I mean, they were so important to me growing up and as I was learning to become a writer. So I really want to embrace those things. It's funny that many are referring to your book as horror or gothic, but I see it as reality that we're not allowing ourselves to see because we're caught up in the process of living. How would you define your book? Yeah, thank you. Exactly the way you said it. That's that's what's real to me. I mean, I think you're exactly right. There's this reality that we live, but then there's so much more uh, around us that we don't know how to access for different reasons. And that includes like maybe the spirit world or alternate realities, you know? So, I mean, some people might say that it dips into even like sci-fi like or speculative um which is something that I never associated with my writing especially as I was writing this mm -hmm. collection um or I've definitely heard like the gothic and the horror uh references which I think are cool because I think those things definitely sort of lurk around in my imagination and also in my influences I mean growing up I was really influenced by Anne Rice and all of the vampire chronicles and I say that with like not an ounce of shame. Like I love like those sexy vampire novels and I still do. And I love the aesthetics of it. And 
I guess when I was writing these stories, I wasn't always aware of those influences creeping in, but I see them now and I could see how people might want to talk about my stories in those um, through those particular genres. But for me, it's it's more I describe it or what feels most organic to me in describing is exactly what you said in, in terms of accessing or or not allowing ourselves to to get in touch with these other realities that we live with and don't know. For the last like five years consistently, we've been talking about the importance of having diverse books, diverse readers, diverse writers. Why is diverse literature important? And why do we need it? Yeah, I think it's so necessary to, I think to, to make literature new, to find new ways to tell, ways to tell stories and to find new stories. Otherwise, we get stuck in, in fiction that sounds the same, that looks the same, that tells the same stories over and over. Thank you so much for joining me on Brown Girl Book Lover. I really appreciate you coming. I, I especially appreciate your very beautiful writing. And I have to say, there's something daring about you as a writer because you've created this collection that is very abstract and beautiful and so thank you for being daring i appreciate oh, thank it thank you leslie and thank you for saying that thank you for for allowing me this joy of talking about my stories with you and and the joy of hearing your thoughts on it um and i'm just honored to join all the other writers that you've already interviewed i was looking around your website and it's just like so impressive and i feel very honored again to to be here with you today Thank you so much. Have a good day. Thank you, Leslie Ann. Bye.